means to them. Every farmer needs to know his number. We need 25% of them knowing their number by the end of this year. Every farmer needs to know their emissions profile by the end of 2022. And they will be working out the pricing mechanisms by 2025. We'll start writing out the checks or whatever by then. Um, climate change. Got some other challenges too. Opportunities for Southland. You know, we uh, talk about that 70% 70, 70 agriculture uh, generating the export revenues. The new world is, is a green energy world, is a green tech world, is a what are our opportunities there? What are some of the comparative advantages that Southland or Gore has got there? Currently we sit there with a um, with the energy generation source that's provisioning 14% of New Zealand's energy at the moment and with this, the government is currently saying, well, what are we going to do with that in the future? Is it is it appropriate that it stays being used at its current source? Or if you wanted to transition to a clean, green economy, what would you be using that 14% of New Zealand's renewable energy for? What are our other opportunities here with our wind resources and our water resources in Southland for electricity, green electricity generation? And they say some of the periphery advantages there, we don't have a great population that will be saying, well, don't put that wind generator near me because <laughs> I don't want to see it. But, you know, as I say, it's kind of one of those sort of periphery um, opportunities that we should be considering. Climate change adds some other challenges too. Um, I'd encourage you guys to read this latest Water Availability and Security in Aotea Rawa report just released about a week ago from MPI. This report validates that our temperature, our climate in New Zealand has increased by one degree in the past 100 years and has challenged or has modelled to move another 0.5 to one degree by 2040 on all the tracks of climate change reduction. It's also modelled, and now it's also validated, that where national rainfall is reduced by 10%, they do it in five-year bands. So get hold of this, since 1996, I think, was the five-year band. Really um, visual in some regions. You know, they've done all the regions in New Zealand. So three take-home messages. Climate's increased, going to keep going for a bit longer till we get this sorted out. Our rainfall um, stability has variable. You'll see it changes, but on a mass, on, on, on balance, it's coming down. We've got to start considering what we do to provision for our communities for water storage and water security. The other flip side of that is the third part of that stool is um, the rainfall events we're having now are coming slightly more sporadically and more in slightly extreme events, like we witnessed in February, was it, recently? Last year. Yep. Now, you'll be well aware that you guys are probably standing on the flood banks wondering if this is going to go to 2,500 cumex or because the flood banks are designed for 2,400 cumex. Mm. Now, if we're going to experience that, what's the stuff we should start talking about as a community? Should we build bigger walls? You only have to go up on a plane and you'll see that, you know, Gore intersects in the southern geocline. It's a bottleneck here. This community, you know, what's the cost of flooding this community, flooding Matara, flooding Wyndham? versus making some intervention, intervention steps that might look along the lines of water security up catchment and integrating nutrient reductions, um, integrating water security, integrating all these sort of challenges we've got. So that's just, I sort of, just uh, want to challenge you guys on that. Look, it, the cost of flooding a town and the risk of it like we saw over on the west coast, it's just too great these days. We've got to start looking at alternative solutions so that's an NPI report. Yeah, yep. So this is on, on the website. This is a really good report because this is... So we're working with a group called the Food and Fibre Partnership Group and we're strategising for the ag sector around all the things we need to start reprovisioning in light of a new uh, some of these challenges. Um, you'll be well aware of the discussions going on in South and Tour and um, so we've got... I always draw three circles when I'm having these discussions. It's carbon, water, biodiversity. These are the three sort of Olympic circles of the sustainability debate. And if we actually get in there and we sort of sort so the, the carbon issue, make the same decisions that, you know, riparian management, integration of trees into our properties, integration of biodiversity, the solutions are all doable and intersect. But these are the discussions we all have to have as a community. Please get close to what Environment Southland's telling us at the moment. There's going to have to be some significant nutrient reductions in the Southland economy when we are so reliant on agriculture I think it would be well worth being cognizant of what impacts that might have there. Um, 
Look, just some of the other things that I think you should be thinking about and considering is, and in that sustainability debate too, one of the conversations we're having nationally is access to capital. Um, it's, this is a bit like the ESG and environmental social governance debate. Um, we don't want to become the tobacco industry of, that's not where we want to be. So in the sustainability debates to protect their communities, we want to reprovision ourselves that people actually, we report on their sustainability, their GHG metrics, their impact on waters, impact on biodiversities, so we can um, access that capital to make this reprovisioning. Um, finally, look, this isn't all doom and gloom. There's a bunch of people working on solutions in here, you know, in that methane debate. You know, we're working on pastoral greenhouse gas research consortium since 2003. We've been working on vaccines, inhibitors to, you know, to solve the, uh, the methane risk profile for agricultural sector. The other big thing I haven't called out, you know, when I talk about that agricultural sector, wool has been one of the, it's one of the problem commodities we're dealing with at the moment, but there's a bunch of work being done on that at the moment. Just to finish up, I've been making five statements to our farming community recently. Um, there's no sector in New Zealand bar none that's had the productivity gains that the sheep and beef sector's had in the past 30 years. There's, no, there's, no, there's none, none can match it. Just done a piece of work at Beef and Lamb, it's been the most profitable decade in 60 years for our sector. Um, you've never had ex cheaper access to capital in the agricultural sector or in New Zealand previously, so in reprovisioning for a lot of these challenges, you've never had cheaper access to capital, and the global demand for your product has never been stronger. So those are four things, and then the, uh, no, I won't say the, f no, I will say the fifth thing, and then the fifth thing, if you're getting really grumpy about this stuff and you don't believe me and you want to sell your farm, you'll probably get a pretty strong record price for it at the moment. So the point being is, look, I, I listed a bunch of challenges there at risk, but these are all things we've just got to think about as a community and how we start reprovisioning and solve these problems so that we can create wealth and prosperity for our community. Sorry, I've raced through that pretty quickly. I think you've done uh, very well there. <laughs> <laughs> Poured a lot of information out onto the floor there, and now we're going to try and put it into piles. Um, and I know you're on a time constraint there, but is there uh, any questions there or any discussion from the councillors? Any further discussion? I'd just like to ask the question, if I may, Mr Chair. Um, given the fact that lamb numbers have been so low, um, where do you, how do you see your group working to increase that? What's going on in your sector? Well, it's slightly almost a misconception. So we've, we've halved our U numbers by about 50%, but our lamb numbers are only 8% down, or, or they're kilograms of product mm -hmm. we sell. And that goes to the point there's no sectors had the productivity gains. So look, uh, the, the size of a sector is not judged by its size, it's judged by the, the wealth that it creates. And so that's why I say I'm agnostic to land use change, but I want our land use change to be linked to market rather than regulatory drivers. And, and going forward, how do you see your group working to produce what consumers want? Yeah, well, we've done a bunch of provisioning in that, you know, and this goes back to that sustainability debate. We've, done, we've, we've initiated a program. You know, government talks a, a program of uh, volume to value. So we identified, we did a big market research piece. We've identified that, you know, we are, I'll use a technical term, we're a diddly squat protein producer globally. We're 2% of, sheep meat's globally 2% of protein, and New Zealand is a small subset of that. But those consumers that want to buy it, they're prepared to pay quite favourably for it. And if we link our, those consumers, if we actively target the ones that want to make the decisions around our production systems, as opposed to buying stuff, say, out of feedlots or out of mass-produced stuff. Then we provisioned a, a program called Taste Pure Nature that we use globally and to provision. And that's backed up by sustainability stories. We've, first time in our history as a sector, we've had what we call the New Zealand Farm Assurance Program, which you have to be part of the New Zealand Farm Assurance Program, which validates all your sustainability metrics to be part of the Taste Pure Nature Program. And we are building on that with what we call the NZFAP Plus now. So that is how we have planned to increase the value linked to our story or linked to the production systems that are quite unique to us in New Zealand. So a Andrew, just a, an observation and a question, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm really encouraged by the message you've given us today uh, and the forward-looking um, nature that uh, 
that beef and lamb are taking to uh, the opportunities that are out there, and they are definitely out there. I guess there's a, I hear a fair bit of noise being made in the, the primary sector at the moment, and most of it is, um, is not the sort of things that, that you're saying, uh, and it's uh, a very negative message. I, I guess as someone that's on the front line and having to deal with that sort of thing all the time, what's the plan? Uh, is there a plan? Is it just a continual getting the information out and hoping people understand? Um, because there does seem to be quite a, a head of steam being, um, being generated. And when the opportunities are there, as you've pointed out, um, I'd hate to see us as a nation, uh, let alone us as a district or as a province, miss out on those opportunities that um, may go begging. begging. Yeah, look, I think it's a great question because, um, in, in any, like, look, you, well, I was talking to you before the meeting, Mayor, and you said, look, you've never been involved in a period where there's been so much change going on. Now, in, when any of us are in a period where there's so much change going on, it's hard to absorb all that change. And you either try and suck it up, like drink from the fire hydrant, take it all in and be positive, and or sometimes you get overwhelmed. And the sections of our community, in all aspects, that are getting overwhelmed. And that's 100% understandable, and it's 100% appropriate to work out how you're going to do. Because, look, there's nothing wrong with saying, look, this is just too much, this is too fast, this is, you've just gone too far here. There's nothing wrong with having those conversations. What you've got to work out there, we're quite open at Beef and Land, we're a solutions-based organisation, you know, because whenever you're faced with a problem, anyone can articulate the problem, the challenge becomes in articulating the solution, doesn't it? And that's the challenge that we have. Not unlike the protests we saw in Wellington yesterday, you know, and um, what it was, we might have seen, let's say we saw 1,500 people protesting. Meanwhile, we've got getting close to 90% of New Zealand's vaccinated. Any of these conversations, you've got to work out whether you listen to the noise or you listen to what's actually going on. So I want to put that in two contexts. It's appropriate to be concerned about the pace of change. It's appropriate to voice that sometimes. Then you've got to work out what you're going to do about that. Councillor Dixon. I have one quick question. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, synthetic meats, is, is that going to be an issue into the future and, and how do you counter that? Yep. So we commissioned a study, you know, it's like any of these things, we uh, quite often take a beating from people that think we, well, why would you do a study on region agriculture? Or why would you do a study on alternative proteins? It's like you're endorsing it. The answer is no. Whenever you see a problem arising, you get close to it and you try and understand what it is. So we commissioned a study, I think it was back 2017. Look, um, alternative proteins are coming and they, uh, there's, there's plant-based alternative proteins and there's cell, 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 cellular-based alternative proteins. Okay, now, everything you do globally has a footprint. And so if you're going to harvest chickpeas, lupins, soyas, make impossible burgers, everything has a footprint, so you're just going to have to report on that footprint. Um, and so that's why it's really, really important that we get our sustainability metrics around the, uh, the, the greenhouse gases appropriate. Um, so, look, don't be scared of change. What we've said is, look, we just have to be quite clear on the consumers that we are targeting. Like I referenced earlier in the day, um, my concerns around water security, I also have concerns that in our lifetime we may experience food security issues globally. You could form quite a plausible argument that any form of protein produced under any system, you know, appropriate system, actually may alleviate those food security issues. So just work out how you're gonna provision your product, what you're gonna do about it, and just have the metrics right to support your claims. Yeah. Okay, no further questions or discussion from the floor? Well, thanks, Andrew, for that. Uh, obviously, um, a lot of information has been passed there and uh, quietly digest it and work through it. Um, I think probably uh, we are lucky to have the, uh, like, as one of our rate payers, <laughs> um, person you're standing, uh, come along and discuss, particularly some of the higher level. Um, I think if we drag down some of those points into our local system and realise that the, the actual um, rely the, or the reliance that we place on the primary industry, particularly in the current uh, national landscape, um, it's it's really kept it has kept us going, kept uh, 
kept the, uh, the world tickling along. And probably a couple of things I've taken out of that is the s sustainability. You've used that word a number of times, sustainable sus sustainability. And that's probably one of the big things about the Gore, uh, Gore district or the greater Gore district that um, you know, we're trying to create through um, some of the um, developments and various projects that we have and um, that it's sustainable and that it's a great, as you say, a great place to live and, and work and also produce. And we, we do have um, some very, very uh, um, favourable assets, particularly around climate and climate change, which in the future will be seen as an asset. So we do need to look at that water storage and banking and what we're producing and that sort of thing. So, But um, thank you for your time. I appreciate that. And if we just move that um, Andrew's report's been received. Uh, Councillor Dixon, seconded by Councillor Reid. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for having me. And look, I'll have to be rude and shoot off because I have to do another thing. But thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And as I say, love the district. Um, love your that you are, you know, looking at opportunities as we go forward. So happy to be part of that. Anytime you want to have a chat. Cool. Thank you. Okay, our second uh, item on the agenda is obviously the Gore High School redevelopment. And I see we have a um, rector, um, John McKinley, down there. Um, he's obviously going to give us a report or uh, speak to us about the redevelopment. We've obviously seen some of it in the media and in various articles and um, just with the work that you've been doing with the ministry and uh, what the plan is going forward. Now, do we need to start something? Oh, no. Okay, so we're just going to work off, obviously, the, the other councillors, the information that we've got in front of us. So the floor's yours, John, and welcome. Kia ora, Mr Chairman and councillors. Thank you very much. Um, right, I've got a couple of wee points to go through here, and then perhaps you can ask questions and we'll go from there, if that's okay. So, um, first of all, is the state of the current buildings, and um, you didn't get this little diagram, but it's quite colourful, and you'll see a lot of orange on that diagram. That's the, that's the Gorhai buildings that are in poor condition. The yellow is fair condition, and the green is good. Mm. So by the look of that, you'll see that the place isn't too good. It was built a long time ago. It's in the oldest 18% of school buildings in the country, and a lot of those will be single-level ones, whereas we're double-story as well. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that we went through quite an analysis with the ministry, who started on option one and tried to, tried to get us through to agreeing to that, and we managed to push them through to an option called option four out of five. So the document they presented to us had five options. We managed to get through to option four. Um, so we thought that was good to start with. Um, there's going to be a lot of demolition. Um, so there'll be about 60% of the current buildings will be demolished. Um, for those of you that know the school quite well, and many of you probably do, the old D block, um, C block, B block, library, music suite, um, they'll all be demolished and some new buildings in their place. Um, so that's quite exciting really. Some of the new buildings, one of the new buildings will be for art, uh, arts rather. So it'll be for drama and music and kapahaka and performing arts of any kind. Because we haven't had a real home for drama for some years. We've had a nice little music suite but it's a leaky building. Um, it works for us well inside, but it leaks quite a lot, and we have to do something about it. So we're, we're aiming to build a thing called a black box theatre that'll be multi-use for that purpose. So it'll be sort of story and a half, because it'll have a high ceiling, it'll have permanent setup for, for doing that sort of stuff. It'll only be about 130 square metres, but it'll be a place where kids can rehearse and do little performances and group work together in all of those disciplines. So that's one of the new buildings we'll be getting. We'll also be getting another double-storey block, a new double-storey block, roughly where the D block is now. And that'll have um, about 12 or so new classrooms in it, and we'll have to fit in technology and science and so on into that too. Um, the library will be incorporated into there. So the library, the vision we have for the library is that it'll be very much a use all the time space and not a place you take a class to and then you take a class back from. It'll be hopefully a bit of a hub. So that's the kind of vision we have for that. Um, one block I didn't mention was the technology block. If you've ever been in there, you'll realise we're very lucky to have a great set of workshops. That's a leaky building as well, but we're going to be keeping that and it'll be repaired and be refurbished. So that's part of the project as well. 
Um, we'll, have to, we'll have to fit into a smaller footprint. One of the things that the Ministry is trying to achieve is get us down to the size that, of the role of the school today, so that's called rationalisation, and we are well oversized for that because the school was very large. Everybody reminds me how many kids were there in the 80s, um, but it's not that way anymore, so that'll have to change. Um, the thing we're looking forward to the most is the flexibility, and that's about curriculum and teaching. It's so, so to me, this whole thing is not really so much about buildings as it is about curriculum. Um, because we teach and we use buildings in different ways. And I said to someone the other day, it's about, you know, if, if people were living in a 1950s bungalow, you know, they built them and didn't matter, the lounge was always to the street, whether it was the south or the east or wherever it was, the lounge was to the street. Mm -hmm. There was a separate little kitchen, you were supposed to go in there and make the meal and then come out. It was a separate place to eat and so on and so forth. And we don't live that way anymore and we don't teach and live that way in schools anymore, so we need a much more flexible, usable space. And that's what we're looking forward to doing. Um, in that regard, it's about, it's about integrating the curriculum more. So we expect to see a lot less boundaries. So if you walk into some of the new spaces, um, you won't be able to look and say, oh, there's the English department, or there's the geography department, or you, know, you might be able to say there's the science department, because you'll see some practical <laughs> facilities. But a lot of the time, it'll be just spaces that we all use and mingle in and out of and um, kids will move between subjects a lot less, a lot more seamlessly than they do now. We're trialling some of that work now. We're trialling that in year nine, right, at the, right this year, for example. So we're following a model that we did, um, we're following a model that we did with technology. So with technology, we trialled some stuff starting about five years ago. We gradually got better and better at it as more staff had some capacity. And then last year when COVID hit, we were up and running really fast. We were already in the cloud, already pretty fully technically on. Mm. So we're doing that with this curriculum stuff too, so that by the time the new buildings are here, we're kind of ready to use them in that new way. Um, for example, we've got some year nine classes working together as a, instead of having science and math separately, they're doing them together, and they're doing a unit on forensics, and then they did a unit on crystals, and one on climate change, and they're doing things on um, the next big shape, whether it's an earthquake or whether it's, an earth or whether it's a volcano and so on and so forth. So they're changing the way, mixing it up the way we're doing our work. So it's really about that. Um, the, the design work, where we are, we're, again, there's a diagram here, you won't be able to read it, there's five steps through, through it. We're three-fifths of the way through that now. So with the ministry in terms of this project, we've already ticked off numbers one, two and three. We're starting the design work, which is out here at four. So it's taken three years to get that far. Um, but that's where we're at now. Um, we expect the design work to take about 12 to 18 months, and that's starting... We, I took a, a group of architects and quantity surveyors through last week. We're expecting to go to Christchurch at the end of this month, and they'll be choosing the lead design teams and all those sorts of things. And then next year we'll be doing the design planning. Um, I think it'll be 2023 before there's wrecking balls on the site, and it'll probably be 2025 before it's all done. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is get it ready for the next 40 to 50 years. Mm -hmm. That's our aim. Mm. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I'll open the um, floor up to questions or discussion regarding that. Um, probably the councillors first. Your Worship. Yeah, oh, just some observations, John. Um, time seems to move incredibly fast sometimes when you're looking backwards. Uh, you're talking about demolishing the library block. I can remember being at school when the lock block was built. Yeah. Um, it doesn't seem that long ago, but I guess it, I guess it was. Um, and look, it's great to see that um, there's new ideas being incorporated into uh, what is what is planned? Uh, I guess one of the questions I want to ask, and I don't know whether you've got an answer to it. You probably haven't at this point, but uh, not so much about the physical state of the of the school going forward, but so w the makeup of education in in our community, uh, and and I know there was some consultation um, between Gore High and Longford with the relevant communities about what the future of that might be. I just wonder if you can give us a bit of an update on what that came out with and does it point in any direction between um, a continuation of the separate campuses 
or uh, does it look towards perhaps sharing campuses? Mm. Mm. I, can, I can talk that, to that a little bit. So we did a big report, I've got it here, uh, that, that um, Gabrielle Walls came down and did, and the outcome of that report was there was quite a lot of um, support within the community to, to put the two schools together. Not as two schools on one campus, though, as, as a new kind of model was really right. where the support was. People didn't see the, any real need to just shift one school and put on another piece of grass. You know? mm. So that wasn't what we were thinking about. There's quite a bit of support for that. Our boards are still working through that, and um, um, many of us would like that to have gone a bit faster, but mm. it's still, they're still working through it. And I think it's still positive in its intent at the right. moment, but there's no final decision reached. Okay. However, the... the the um, the driver for that really was this curriculum again, because we think that we can, if we can start them at year seven and take them right through, we think, and, and the Longford staff, we've talked to them a lot about this too, and we've visited some schools in Auckland where this was happening, mm. we think we can design a year seven to nine or seven to ten curriculum where kids can have a lot more of an interesting time and be a lot more challenged. There's no reason, for example, why a year seven kid has to take one year in year seven and then one year in year eight and then mm. one year in year nine. There's no reason why you couldn't have somebody in year seven working line, somebody in year nine on a module work for right. three months and then with new changes and choices they are working with a different group of children. Mm. So there's no reason why it can't be quite a different model. And it's that kind of thing we're interested in. And I think the, the idea of bringing the two schools together is still a possibility but it's not decided yet. Right. So um, just thinking ahead, you know, should that ever happen, uh, is, the, is the construction that's planned for the new Hall, Hall, uh, Gohai campus, is it going to be um, relevant and um, compatible with the numbers of people that will likely to become? Yeah. So um, ideally, the decision as to whether Longford and Gore High School want to get together or not would come in the next few months, ideally. Mm. Okay. okay. If that happened, then as we go into the detailed design, we can keep that in mind straight away. If that doesn't happen, the design work we've done so far, which is really just conceptual, has got places where we can add to a right. block or okay. put a, you know, rather than put a new block, actually extend the block a little mm. bit further, which would then accommodate that kind of issue. Yep. Okay. And a third question that is not really related to the construction of the building, but um, the the use of the, the property in total, um, I know there's a fence been gone along uh, part of the sports field and, and what have you, and you've got the sports fields across the road. Um, is, is that still, what, what, what's happening with that at the moment? Yeah. The, the um, the Coots Road field, we call it. I mean, they're mm. both on Coots Road. I don't know why they call it one Coots Road. <laughs> the one over by Frank Street, anyway, up along there, there's no, no plans to change that. That's yeah. still going to be our sports field as such. The other side, the memorial gates uh, will stay with, with the current school property, and there's a fence, you might notice, on the east yep. of that. Mm. Um, the property on the east of that is now owned by the ministry, and they should be um, disposing of that. It, it should be going through their disposals okay. process. Right. Okay. That's good. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Reid. Yep, thank you, Mr Chair. So, John, when you're saying it's going through a di disposal process, does that have to go back to um, Iwi and, and that for, um, to see whether or not they have a need for it before it's disposed of? Yes, I understand. So I think, I think if, the, if the land was gifted to the school in the first place, it has to be offered mm -hmm. back there. Yeah. Then it has to be offered to local envy, mm -hmm. and then the next step would be to whoever, I suppose. And, and back to the floor plan that we have at the school in front of us. Um, technically, even if it takes a wee while to um, have Longford come on site or not, there's still plenty of room there for expansion, isn't there? Yes, there is. Um, so, and, and they've got a couple of future expansion sort of. Um, yeah. lines built in there so I think that we're well endowed with land aren't we? Yes, we're very we lucky mm. so I, I think that it could easily be expanded like for example our learning support um, area where we have uh, my plan my, my dream would be to shift that as well and to put it over near a Robertson Street where it's a lot more accessible for parents coming in with their children being able to drop them off on our property instead of on the street right. and drive out again and so on and 
and it would be nice and near the new library and uh, near where there's a lot of flow. It wouldn't be sort of tucked on the end of a building. It would be on the end of a building, but not sort of out on its own. So there's kind of things like that that I haven't given up yet. There's a few more things we'd like to try and get. <laughs> and just one other question. Um, because that land is there, is there any possibility in the future, like we'd had that discussion through the Streets Alive program, um, dirty word, but there you go, um, to be able to have a bus hub on that, a way so that it takes the kids off the street. I'd be really mm -hmm. keen to see something like that so it's a much more uh, safe environment for children to be delivered and then picked up. Yeah. Mm. I think um, originally I thought that could be done quite easily, really, just build us a new school further over and put a bus hub around the entire corner. But the ministry didn't fly for that. Um, so that's a wee bit harder now because we've got to relocate our horticulture area. That'll take up a bit of the land where the old hostel was, um, where you might have thought of the buses may coming in. Mm. So that's a wee bit harder now than it was. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for that, John. It looks exciting. Um, just what I see you've got car parking. Is that? going to try and take some of the students' cars off the street, or is that more for um, the staff? Depends who gets there the earliest. <laughs> I think it's probably supposed to be for staff and for parents coming as visitors and for visitors. Um, any other questions here from the councillors' discussion? Um, thank you, John. Obviously, uh, that was... Um, interesting, there was a few blocks that you mentioned in there, and I'm a bit like Tracy. Uh, there's a couple of those blocks there that I actually remember um, with pain, um, probably due to some of the corporal punishment that used to come out in, the, in my day there. So, But uh, I had a couple of questions. Um, the, the current role, what's the current role at the school, number-wise? Yeah, it's a bit under 500. We started this year about 485 or something like that predicting just slightly less than that next year. Um, that's mainly because there are a slightly smaller group coming through from Longford Intermediate, so that affects us a lot. Um, and after that, it's supposed to steady up and come up a bit. It's very hard to predict those, and I, I always get frustrated that the ministry tend to use... Um, I suppose they try and use census data, but they don't tend to forward think any other opportunities that are happening in the district. So they don't think about forward employment opportunities or industries that are starting to flourish in Gore District. They just go on the numbers they've got now. So it's a bit of a hard argument for us to fight sometimes. And uh, obviously the census data that it works on um, were a bit marginal anyway with the, the previous census data and, and what could be coming. Um, just in regard to the You've obviously got the partnership through there with Iwi and the, the Hokanui Runanga. Yep. Um, is there other, uh, within the school, cultural di diversity, like with the groups, because we're seeing it within the community strategy, like the work that the team have been doing, um, there's a huge, you know, quite a huge melting pot of different cultures mm. currently within the Gore area. Do you see mm. that through the school with some of the groups? and? Um, yeah, there's little wee pockets of it, but we don't have any great lot of children in any one particular diverse community. So um, we do have a few. We have a few Pacifica, for example, a few Filipino, um, some other Asian cultures, but it's very limited, really. Um, so it's mostly for us about 17% Maori. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the big one for us. And um, there's quite a lot of work going on through not only um, wanting to make this building reflect our culture, um, but there's also quite a lot of work going on NCA with, in terms of Mataranga Māori and valuing Māori knowledge and Māori ways of, of learning. So that's probably the big push. Is, is that a, um, the, the, uh, well, the model that you're following? Is it currently being used in another, like if, are you looking at another school around, or does the ministry sort of have a, a model school around the countryside, or is it something that you adapt to the area? Yeah, no, they don't have a model school that I'm aware of. We have looked at various schools. Um, we looked at one in Australia. We've looked at several in Auckland, some in Hamilton. Looked at Christchurch, and we know a bit about our own district. Looked at a few there. So the the one we have seen the most in terms of curriculum that we like is one in Auckland, and its curriculum would not just transpose into Gore. It's just it's giving us ideas, and we have to design our own. 
and make it fit our community. So that's mm. where we're up to. Yeah, we're, we're a fairly unique community. And I don't think uh, the Auckland template would be put across Gore easily. So, no. um, Is there any other? So just a question around the arts block that you're talking about, John. Mm. Um, will that encompass performing arts? Yeah, so, so a black box theatre, um, mm. Does anyone know what a black box theatre is? Am I talking no. to the people? Sorry. Right. So let's say a room about maybe two thirds the size. So let's say same length, maybe right. about two thirds the width, right? And um, flat floor, no rises. You bring those in when you need them. Completely black, black walls, black ceiling, permanent lighting in. Down one end, there'd be a U shaped curtain. Um, so if a little drama group wants to do a production, they get into that curtain area few seats at this end, maybe okay. ones that can pull out from the wall, 30 mm. or 40 people can watch, watch a little play or something right. like that. Okay. Um, but equally music groups could use it, dance groups could use it. When you're rehearsing, the curtains go back, there's mirrors so they can see what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, I was just interested in the potential size of that and potential for community use as well, but yeah. it is quite small. It would it? be reasonably small. Yeah. It'd be lovely to build it bigger, but it wouldn't, on the, on the ministry's funding, we wouldn't mm. manage it. Yeah. Uh, any other discussion there from councillors? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, John, for that update. It, that's um, it's a big project, and it's a it's a great looking project. And I think if we uh, align that with with our previous um, matter on the agenda, um, it's about sustainability. And you sort of indicated that yourself. We're trying to future proof ourselves for the next 40, 50 years. Um, and uh, I think that the southern region is going to be a desirable place to be. Yeah. Uh, as the, the, the way things are going globally. And I think we'll be, we'll be seeing that in our census data. Um, if I just have someone move that um, the rector's report's received. Uh, Councillor Grant and seconded Councillor Reid. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your time. Okay, we move on to uh, a report, the Welcome Plan report, which uh, we've had a copy in the notes there from our, our, our CEC, or our Community Empowerment Coordinator, uh, Mark. So, um, <laughs> so, sounds quite official, that CEC. It is, doesn't it? <laughs> well, you've got to have an acronym there, so um, the, floor's, yeah, the floor's yours, Mark. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I firstly wanted to reiterate um, the importance of the new Gore District Welcome Plan. Um, as I've said before, we have at least 45 different ethnicities in the Gore District, um, and we're still counting. Um, that represents about at least 8% of the Gore District population, according to the last census. Um, but according to Stats New Zealand uh, projections, this number is going to increase. Um, and it's important to note that 8% does not include people from Wales, from the UK, from the US, from Australia, international students, and New Zealanders relocating within New Zealand who are defined as newcomers within the Welcome Plan as well. Um, it was interesting listening to John just talk about the number of um, people from different ethnicities within the high school. Um, so we spoke to uh, St. Peter's College and the population of overseas born students there is actually 11% and that didn't include international students which took that figure then to 14% mm -hmm. so quite a high number um, so the success of the welcoming communities pilot scheme which we are a part of um, along with eight other councils um, it's had huge success and has now extended to 17 councils within the country which is great news, and more and more are signing on each month. Um, as part of the agreement that we have with Immigration New Zealand, we need to produce a welcome plan for the area. Um, this used to be a Southland-wide plan, but after talking with Immigration New Zealand, they've encouraged us to tailor our plan to the Gore District, which differs vastly from Invercargill, for example. Um, so the Gore District Council itself has, through consultation with a representative group of local people and newcomers to the Gore community, embarked on developing a new welcome plan which is tailored to our needs. Um, it's a community-driven 
council document. We felt that, uh, within the community strategy team that is, that as a council, it needs to be a council document because we are welcoming these people. And we also felt that there may not be the capacity for them themselves to drive the plan because they'll be working themselves. Um, it's a five year plan uh, to enable us to align it with the next LTP as well. Um, the opportunities, issues, concerns and opportunities raised by the representative group are the underpinning aspects of this new plan. Um, the plan includes opportunities and initiatives aimed at raising cultural awareness and overcoming barriers to integration for both the local community and newcomers. The plan itself is about support and empowerment, hence the, type, the new title, for the newcomer community. Immigration New Zealand themselves have been very interested in the approach which we've taken, uh, which reflects the newcomer voices themselves rather than what we want to do for them. And they are proposing that we feed forward this approach to other councils. It's been really well received. Um, so moving forward, we need permission from the council to send out the welcome plan to public for their feedback. Mm -hmm. We propose doing that on November the 15th, in a couple of days' time, and for this feedback to end on November the 9th before taking it to the representative working group, um, which I have to say um, had offered to come here today to support this, um, but for obvious reasons couldn't be here. And once the working group has gone through those suggestions, we will bring it back to council in the new year. Any questions? Thank you. Um, congratulations, Mark. I'm very, very impressed with this report. Um, awesome. Extremely well done. And thank your team as well. Um, I know I was on the initial one, and believe you me, we didn't put it together anywhere near as quickly as this. It took a couple of years plus, and it certainly wasn't as detailed or as interesting. And particularly, as you said, asking... Um, the immigrants themselves, the newcomers themselves, to actually participate was a brilliant stroke. I like it. Um, I'm really, really excited about what you've done here. I think it's brilliant. And um, it's very interesting reading because one of the things I did notice is that we do pride ourselves on being friendly, but hmm. maybe we're not that friendly. And I think um, as time goes on, we're going to have a lot more um, different ethnicities and different or New Zealanders from different parts of the country as well coming down. So I think we're on to a good thing here. So thank mm. you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, if I can just respond to that, this has been very, very much a team effort um, from Anne um, coming up with the idea to approach the newcomer community to get their voice and them coming on board and really embracing the process and supporting the process and... Um, coming forward with some fantastic ideas and there's lots of opportunities there there really are so yeah it's been a real team effort and I've got to say the um, the plan itself is it, it looks great thanks mm. to Rebecca and her hard work yeah so um, thank you Thank you. And I, I do notice that's one thing that it's 
every issue that would be facing somebody coming to the district has been covered. And um, I think it's a really good template for us to take notice of and, and work alongside you guys to make it easier to implement. Um, the International Connect Group that Anne just referred to, not only did they provide the forum for us to carry out the workshop that provided newcomers with the opportunity to share their voice, and um, Mayor Tracy Hicks was there, as was um, the chair, um, but that group also will provide a large amount of the driving force moving mm -hmm. forward. A, a lot of good things come from that group. They've started up new clubs of their own, which are very inclusive of the local community as well. So we, um, we really will hit the ground running with this. Yeah. Mr Chair, I'd just like to endorse the comments that have been made um, by Bronwyn so far. Um, the, the, the style, um, the uh, content, the whole direction of the plan uh, is, is absolutely fantastic. And uh, I look forward to seeing what feedback we do get from the wider community. And, and just on that point, Mark, I was gonna ask, how's that gonna be circulated? How's, how, how, how are people gonna know about this? Um, so we've been working with Sonia, mm -hmm. um, the comms manager on this. And um, so it'll go online. Um, as well as um, through uh, different channels um, um, that I uh, oversee myself, and we'll get it out there as much as possible within the district, both newcomers and local community, and encourage their feedback. They can contact us directly as well, give their feedback. Um, yeah, and we would encourage people to really have a good read of it, and please, yeah, give us your thoughts. Well, well done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's a fantastic thought and, um, and I love it and I think it en embraces everything that we would want as a council and a district and we're welcoming people. The only thing I would suggest was maybe page 45 doesn't look particularly familiar to me as being a Gore district photo. It looks more like um, some very tall mountains somewhere. Right, yes. Yeah, no, I see your point. <laughs> no, I don't think it's the back face of the Hokanuis. No. Yeah, Mark, just want to say what everyone else is saying. Yeah, fantastic report, good reading, um, plenty of engagement with the, um, the newcomers and and obviously you've met up with them and they've given you suggestions as well. Um, I did have a wee idea just to try and get them into the community, into the sporting organisations. It's like, kind of like what the um, schools do with the um, older kids and that, doing a careers <laughs> evening and that. And maybe you could get the, um, say the rugby clubs and croquet clubs and bowling clubs, um, get people to come and have a yarn and, and then maybe help get some of these people into these sporting venues. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to, yeah, it's a, to take, yes, we are very nice front on, but yeah, mm. deep down it would be good to get involved with these with the newcomers and um, make them really welcome into the community. Absolutely, so they, yeah. It is easy to join um, into clubs and you don't have to go looking if we had them all in one area for a night for them. And, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. make connections that way. Awesome. But yeah, yeah, great report. Really great idea. Reading it. And even have a go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And yeah. I did like the idea of yeah, walking them around town and um, yeah, I thought that was quite neat. And yeah, I'd be definitely keen to, to join the Awesome, the and that'd be great. And just make conversations with them and yeah. Brilliant, make them feel welcome. Exactly, thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion or commentary there? Okay, um, yeah, I'll just reiterate what everyone said, Mark. Good job done. Um, and also obviously through to uh, some of the people that were contracting in and doing uh, some of the consultant work there, Rebecca and, and that crew, they, they're doing a marvellous job. It's good good, um, good bang for buck, to coin that phrase. And I think um, that on page 28 of our report, if we look at that page 14 uh, of your plan, a cultural competency, the, dis the definition of it, is where two people can actually stand there and look at each other and say that phrase. You know, the ability to un understand, appreciate and interact with people from cultures or beliefs systems different from one's own. 
Um, I think that we've probably got the cornerstone on the ground uh, in Gore now. Um, we are, we're, you know, we're doing some great work and making some inroads there. And I think it's, it goes both ways because there's people within the community are qu not quite sure what they're meant to do, um, particularly some of our older, older folk or people that haven't had that travel experience or that interaction with different cultures and they want to be involved but they're not quite sure whether they're going to you know, put their foot in it or say the wrong thing or do something that's um, culturally insensitive. So, um, yeah, no, kudos to that. Uh, so we just need to... Um, have someone pass at that report. Mr Chair. Do, do, we, do we want to discuss the photo? Are you quite... <laughs> we can um, look to see if we can have something to change. If we have something before it goes out, we'll see what yeah. we can do. Otherwise, yeah. for the final copy, and then yeah. we can see what we can discuss. Yeah. Mr Chair. Just, but, um, yeah. Mr Chair, I, I, I'd, I'd be the same as Glenn, so I'd, I'd like to see that we try and use local photographs in, yeah. the, in the report if possible. Thanks. Okay, so I think the, okay. the, the committee would probably like to see a localised photo. I'm sure you'll be able to uh, do that. I'm sure Rebecca will, one of you will find something there that will fit that um, framework. Um, but uh, with that in mind, uh, if I could just have someone to... Uh, Mr Chair, that. before we do oh, that, sorry. can I just make one more comment? Um, I said earlier that the... Um, the working group would love to have been here to support this today and I know that they'll be tuning in so I just wanted to say a big thank you to them for all their support and the working group as well moving forward um, thank you no uh, yeah, and obviously the committee uh, would recognize your efforts as well um, we know that we know that you're not solely leading the charge and you've no. got a great a great uh, battalion behind you that's helping yeah, out so. absolutely um, so with that, and obviously that photographic change, um, if we just recommend that, so that will go, we will recommend that that goes out. You've got a short period of time there where it's placed through the comms and then we'll get the feedback and it'll come back through um, the main, it will come through one of our main council meetings. Um, the, the feedback goes back to the reference group and they get to decide what should go in the plan and then it will come back to this committee. Okay. And we will document that Okay, it sounds like a good process. Um, if we we'll just have someone move that recommendation, Councillor Reid, send it to Councillor Dixon. Um, and thank you, Mark, for the thank report. Um, I think that, unless there's any other general business at the end, I didn't actually ask if there's any late business or general business, but um, if there's nothing else from the floor, the CEO's happy over there, that's the main thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's away. Uh, so at uh, 4.50, um, we'll end the meeting. Thank you for your attendance and thank you for your involvement, councillors.